Hi there, it's John from It's More Than Just Gaming.com. Welcome. In this video, I'm going to be doing uh, I'm going to be doing a how to play video for the game Lords of Hellas by Awaken Realms, a Kickstarter that I recently did an unboxing video for, um, and I wrote about it on my website. There will be a link to that article at the bottom of this video. But the reason you're most likely here, and sorry, I'm just going to sort the board a little bit because actually a little ah, that's good enough. Good enough is sometimes good enough. Uh, but the reason you're probably here is you want to actually learn how the game plays um, and actually it turns out there's not an awful lot of videos out there that do that so I thought I would pr make one for you so hopefully this helps so let's get started so at the start of the video the, it was a zoomed out version of the main board and now I've zoomed in a little bit to actually give you a little bit more idea of the game and some of the elements in it. The smallest unit of land in the game is a region which uh, you should see here. Um, land borders count as adjacent to other regions so focus is next to Boeotia. Um, and apologies to anyone who is Greek and who knows that I'm making a pig's ear of pronouncing these things. Uh, but they share a land border, so they're adjacent. Boeotia has a dotted line, which counts as a sort of like a, a naval trade route. So that makes Eboa and Boeotia adjacent for the purposes of trip movement, for hoplite movement, which I'll come to. Regions have on them a population strength, which is represented by a picture of a hoplite next to their name. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit closer on that. Yes, I can. Uh, Boeotia has a, a population strength of two. It starts out as neutral. If you move two hoplites in there, then you would gain control of it. Um, whilst we're there, um, I'll say that this little symbol represents it's got a city in it. Um, and you can fortify your hoplites in cities. Um, that gives them a defensive bonus, basically, when uh, battles happen. Uh, there's a special city, Sparta, which is in Laconia at the bottom of the board. Um, I'll so Let's actually zoom out and zoom in on that. So here we have in Laconia, Sparta, which gives you a plus two defense bonus, and it's got a population strength of five, so it's a little bit harder to control Sparta in the beginning. Um, all of these lands that I've been talking about, they um, have colours to them, and lands of the same, uh, sorry, all of these regions have colours, and regions of the same colour make up a land. One of the victory conditions is to control the number of lands. Um, so we've talked about the cities denote, uh, symbols denoting cities and Sparta. We've talked about uh, population strength. We also need to talk about shrines. So let's actually go and look at one of the shrine symbols. Some regions in the map, denoted by the shrine symbol here, have shrines in them. Can you see that? Actually, um, it appears to the right of the, um, the region description. Um, that symbol means that there is a shrine there, and that means that it is possible to build a temple there. And actually, I specifically chose Focus, because that is where the Oracle of Delphi, a, a special temple, can be built. Um, there are other shrines on the board, um, but I decided to pick that one just because the symbol is uh, the same for all of them. Next up is you set up the bases of the three monuments that you're going to have in the game, or, or, the, or rather the monuments you're going to have in the game, because there is actually a fourth space for a fourth monument. Uh, there are three named monument locations on the map, and I'm just going to set them up just now. So you put in the base for Athena's monument, uh, that's in Attica. Zeus, his monument is in Thessaly, and Hermes is in Arcania. So you set up all of those uh, those three monuments there. If you ha know anything about the game, you've probably seen the monuments on all their glory. Sadly, they don't start built up on the board because part of winning the game is actually one of the ways to win the game is building a monument. Next up, we're going to want to sort out the event, uh, the basic decks that you start with in the game. So at the top of the board, you've got the events deck, the monster attack deck, and the blessings deck. The events deck has all the quests and monster activations or monster appearance cards in it. So you just take your events cards, which look like these. And they have the, oh, actually, yep, yeah, that's a little bit out of focus and you then place them on the events track or you would shuffle them first 
and I haven't shuffled them there, so let's quickly shuffle them. And then you put them on there. You then take the monster attack deck, shuffle these cards, place them at the top of the board, can't help getting into shot there. And then you take the blessings for the gods that are in the game. So if you're just using the base game with Athena, Hermes and Zeus, just take the blessings for Athena, Hermes and Zeus. Shuffle them, which I have to admit I thought was a little bit weird, but you shuffle them. Um, and they form the blessings deck. Zeus tends to be strength related blessings, Hermes is speed and Athena is leadership. As you might expect. Next up at the bottom left hand corner of the board you're going to set up the combat cards. So you take the combat cards deck, you then shuffle them again, and then place them there. You then also set up the artifact deck. Now you, there are neutral artifacts that just have this ring on the back, you would shuffle them, which I did before I set up the camera, but there are also other special artifacts for the gods involved and for the monsters involved. So if you are got different, once, once all the Kickstarter expansions have shipped and perhaps there's future expansions available for purchase, you might want need to sort out which of the god artifacts you put close to the board. I'm going to put Hermes, Athena and Zeus. In fact, I'm going to put Hermes artifact at Hermes statue, uh, Athena's artifact at her statue, and Zeus at his statue. Sorry, that's off camera, I can't help that just now. But there are also monster artifacts. Uh, so there's the Cyclops artifact, for instance. There's the Cerberus one. There you go. I'm going to pop them close to the board because they will probably be coming in handy later when people start hunting the monsters. Now, the one drawback of a game like this is there's a lot of things to keep handy. Um, there's a lot of components. What you're going to want to keep close to the game board are the monsters in the game. So I'm just going to keep the box of the monsters that you get with the game. I'll keep it to one side over here. You're going to want to keep the monument part. So there's the uh, bits of Hermes there. And we'll need bits of Zeus. And we're going to need, oh, you can't see, well, I'm going to zoom out a little bit and I'll keep Zeus and Hermes apart because Zeus is father of the gods and Hermes is a glorified postman. And then we're going to add in Athena over here as well. Um, we're also going to need the quest, uh, the quest region tokens. They are little rectangular, th whoa, nearly dropped them there. The quest region tokens, there's a stack of them, one for each quest. We are going to need wind cubes for monsters. We're going to need monument activation cards. Oh, I've missed a couple of the monsters, uh, the quests I should say. Um, we're going to need the help trays for the monster hunts. Now, keep them to one side. We will need the monster dice. And there are glory tokens, which are little hexagonal multicolored tokens, one for each land. I'll pop this over here. We then take the temple cards. There's a stack of them. We shuffle and randomly take one. and the rest of them go back in the box. This is the temple card we've drawn, I'll just show you where that is in a minute. Each of the temple cards has, cards has a track 1 to 8 where you will place uh, temples. Now there are card temples with little standees that come with the base game but I got I actually bought the sort of like the terrain expansion so I've got little temple miniatures and you basically put one temple on for each box and every time someone builds a temple at a shrine you take off the first one um, so let's actually set it up first. So blah, blah, 
you'll notice that some of the uh, boxes are green and some of them are red with the word draft in them. When you build a temple that reveals a red box with the word draft in it, you do a blessings draft. And I will speak about that uh, later on in the video. Also, there is the Oracle of Delphi. When you build the do the build temple in Focus or Phosis, I'm not sure um, that you build specifically the Oracle of Delphi, and you get the Oracle of Delphi uh, bonus, which is different on every card. On this one, it says you can play an additional special action this turn. Uh, when you're playing two to three players, you would only use six temples. Um, and for the purposes of this video, I'm only going to use two forces, but I'm setting up the full game so that you can play it. Uh, because I'm not going to do a playthrough, I'm just going to do, this is how you play the game. We're actually almost ready to pick our forces and start the game. The last thing that you need to generically do is to... Uh, pick the starting event. So you take the event deck, I've actually taken it off the board for the purposes of this demonstration, and you draw the top seven cards uh, and resolve them. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over the first one. It's a quest. The second one is a monster. I'm going to put the monster on a different row because you resolve all the quests first and then you do the monsters. There's another monster. And you're going to turn over seven cards. Like I say, there's another quest. I'm going to move the monster artifacts out of the way for the moment. Got another quest there and another quest so we've got four quests and two monsters so far we've got five quests and two monsters and the rules say place the quest cards in the quest slot and their appropriate marker in the appropriate region so we're going to do the cattle of Geryon, capture the Cretan bull and saving Prometheus um, I will pop them on the quest track in just a minute Ignore quests beyond the third one. So basically, they're going to be discarded just now. Or they'll be shuffled back into the deck, I should say. Uh, but we'll get to that. So we now want to set up these three quests. At the top of the game board, next to the events Monster Attack and Blessings deck, you'll see there are three quest track spaces. So I'm going to put Cattle of Geryon um, in the first one. Capture the Cretan Bull. Um, Gary, Cattle of Geryon is in Boeotia. Capture the Cretan Bull is in Crete, unsurprisingly. And Saving Prometheus is in Macedonia. You'll actually see on these cards that they do actually have the region sort of like marked in colour to show you where the, the quests actually are. Um, and they correspond to the quest tokens. So let's actually put them out just now. So now that we've put out the quest markers, we've got a Saving Prometheus token now on Macedonia. We have a Cattle of Geryon marker in Boeotia. And we have the Capture Cretan Bull in Crete. Um, so those quests are on the board until a hero goes to them and completes the quests. And I'll talk about more how you do that later on in this video. You'll remember we also drew two monster cards. Cerberus and Hydra. Now with the monster cards, when drawing a monster card you place it in the region that it's placed. So we resolve them in the order that they appeared. So Cerberus, it says on Cerberus's card that it goes into the Locris region. So I'll pop Cerberus and Locris. He's over there. And I'll zoom out on the board in just a minute. Hydra is in uh, quite near the top in Chalkioiki. I'm reasonably certain I got that wrong, um, but it's actually quite far at the top of the board. I will move it in just a second. You place the corresponding monster tray and its artifact along the side of the board. Well, there's the monster trays and the artifacts are already there. I put them there earlier. If the monster card that I'd drawn, if for instance I'd drawn two Cerberus cards, we don't draw a second Cerberus. But there is actually an evolve. Basically, it gets evolved. So that means it, it gets another wound that requires this particular type of damage. Um, so if you put out a monster and then you draw another monster card, you get a tougher version of that monster. Um,
No, actually, to tell a lie, absolutely tell a lie, that happens later on the board. If you draw the second, if you draw mo uh, a, a second copy of the same monster, you discard that card and draw again, basically. Sorry, the evolving thing happens during play, not during setup. That'd be quite mean. Sorry, I misread the rules there. Now with the monsters on the board, Cerberus there and Hydra over there, you take all of the event cards that you've drawn, apart from the quest and the quest slots, and you shuffle them back into the events deck, because there are circumstances where you'll be drawing events during the game. So I'll just do that, and I will pop it back on the table, and then we'll get to picking sides. Okay, now the game board itself is set up, the players need to sort themselves out. So, each player takes a combat card at the start, and they take a help tray, which I'm assuming is what these cards are. It's got the player turn summary on one side, and strength calculation for battles on the other side. It's not a bad idea, I think, to have the sort of like the god powers as well per player. Um, because it shows you all the, the activation levels of each of the monuments and how you do the hunts. So each player gets those, as far as I'm concerned. And then you determine player one. Player one will then choose a hero and an army board of, of whichever colour they like. I mean, the way that they came in the box, the, the heroes were actually attached to army boards, and I have then basically decided that hero has that coloured army. So for the purposes of the tutorial, I'm going to take the hero Perseus, and it was attached to the green army board. So I'm going to take, I've actually already sorted all of these miniatures into bags, so I'm going to take the green miniatures. Um, so we have Perseus himself. There are coloured rings that's supplied with the game that you put around the base of your hero if you want to change around the army colours. There are these tokens here, which are control markers. So you're going to need some of them. You've got your priests, which you don't start any, you don't start with any of those. More control markers, and these are your hoplites. So that's the sort of stuff that you should actually be starting with. And then you will also have three attribute markers that you put at rank one on your leadership, your strength, and your speed. These improve as you pray to the gods. You have on your army board a space for four priests uh, hang on, sorry, I've made a pig's ear of this, but never mind. We we move on. There are spaces for your four priests here. When you recruit priests, they go into your priest pool. So if it, say, for instance, I've recruited a priest, um, it would go here and is ready to go and pray at a temple. But you don't start with any. You do, however, start with uh, one hero and two hoplites. So what you would do is... Once you've actually got all your stuff there, um, what you then do is you resolve any starting bonuses. So Perseus actually has a starting bonus of you take the glory token of the region you're going to start in. So I think Perseus might actually start over... Let's have a look over here. I've decided that Perseus was, is going to start in Attica. Um, but you don't just put your hero down, you actually get to start with two hoplites as well. So Perseus and two uh, uh, hoplites start in Attica. Um, Attica has a, um, a region strength of five, that's not enough for Perseus to control it. Um, the re region remains neutral, however his starting uh, bonus allows him to get the glory token uh, for that land. So Perseus gets uh, the blue glory token. Uh, glory tokens are useful for one of their actions later on, which I'll talk to you about shortly. Um, and that's Perseus is now ready to um, set up. Actually, that's I tell a lie. Um, you should also have six used action tokens each, which are...
basically little red crosses. They have numbers on the back, which I think is for the solo mode, the Persian invasion. You have six of those, I'll explain them just shortly. Once Perseus is actually, or once I have finished placing Perseus in his two hoplites, um, then player, my player setup is finished and I move around, we move around the table to the right having each player set up in turn. If a player puts um, their starting troops on a region that they have sufficient hoplites to control, so actually I'm going to zoom out a little bit, um, and I have a second set of miniatures ready. I'm going to use Heracles in the Red Army. And Heracles and his forces are going to actually set up in Boeotia, right next door to Perseus. Because it's easy to get them all on camera. And I can actually use it just later. However, what's really interesting is that it's region strength of two and they have two hoplites. So Heracles takes control of that region. And that's Heracles set up. He gets the, the, the same uh, the, the help boards and the, the god activation cards and all that that Perseus did. I've just skipped over that for the purposes of the video. I'm just popping them down there just now. So let's actually zoom in and get a closer look. So here we have the start of the game. We've got Perseus set up with his two hoplites in Attica, which is where the base of the Athena statue is. Heracles is in Boeotia with his two hoplites and he's managed to seize control of it. And that's where the Cattle of Geryon quest is. And a couple of regions away in Locris you've got Cerberus. The Hydra is a little bit further north and obviously the other uh, monuments are off shot at the minute. So let's talk about the victory conditions. There are four victory conditions to Lords of Hellas. Uh, one, control two lands, which is basically one land, as I said earlier, is all the regions of one colour. Um, and if you control two lands, then you win. Um, in a three-player game, the blue land does not count. In a two-player game, you need four land, uh, sorry, three lands in total. You can be favoured of the gods to win, and that means if you control five regions with temples, you win. And you can be a monster slayer and win. If you kill three monsters in monster hunts, you win. You can also be king of kings. Control a region with a fully built monument after three turns, after the third turn that it's complete. Um, if you hold on to that, if you control that monument three turns after it's complete, then you win. And if you didn't know, that's what a fully fledged monument looks like when it's completed. Like I said earlier, doesn't start that way on the table, but you can build it up. And if you control the region that it's in, uh, with three turns at the after it's completed, you win the game via King of Kings. Um, we don't do that victory condition in a two-player game, however. I think that possibly makes it a little bit too easy. Okay, so... You then start doing, once you've actually put out all of your um, forces, all the, once all the players have actually placed their hero and their starting hoplites, the last person who put down their hero and their hoplites becomes player one. And then you just um, carry on uh, going round uh, left uh, round the table uh, once each player's had their turn. Each player turn uh, consists of regular actions and special actions, and I'm going to go through them just now. Um, you can you have quite a few of each. Uh, in the case of regular actions, you can perform all of them once, uh, but you must actually complete one of the regular actions before you move on to the next one. So I'm going to use the use artifacts regular action. If you have two artifacts, you need to use them both at the same time. You cannot use artif one artifact, move your hoplites, and then use your other artifact. To use an artifact, what you would do is, if you had one, see, let's see, we've got the Horn of Plenty. Recruit two hoplites in a region, or in any region with a city or Sparta that you control. So that's an artifact, so you would recruit two hoplites, put them in a city or Sparta that you control. You would then exhaust the card. Um, the artifact is no longer charged and cannot be used until it's charged up again. The next regular action you can take is Prayer, and that 
only happens when you have a priest in your priest pool. If you have a priest available in your priest pool, you can send it to any of the monuments that has a vacant slot. That's what these are. And you would basically place the priest in that vacant slot. And that priest is then praying to that god or goddess. Um, and you immediately raise the your hero's attribute corresponding to the god. So in the case of Athena, it's leadership. Hermes is speed and Zeus is strength. Um, and then you activate the god power. At level one, there are no god powers, but at level two, um, you might, in the case of Athena, you recruit one hoplite in any of your regions. And basically, the more you build up Athena, the more hoplites you can recruit just by praying to her. That priest will stay there until someone uses a build monument special action, and that will prevent other priests praying there. The next regular action is that you can use is hero movement. Uh, you look at your um, hero and army board and look at your hero's speed. And that is how many regions your hero can move. So Heracles starts with speed 1. So he could move to Corinthia if he wanted to. He could move to Phocis if he wanted to. He could move into Attica if he wanted to. Uh, or into Ebola, that one over there. But he could basically do that. Um, and that would be no problem for him. If he had speed 2, he could go... Or, if he had speed 2, he could go and actually face Cerberus. He doesn't have speed 2, so never mind. And you can't see that, because Cerberus is too far away. No, you can. Uh, let's see, are there any other special things about hero movement? If a hero ends a turn on the same space as a quest token they, and they meet the requirements of the quest, they can immediately move to the first space of the quest track, or the appropriate uh, space on the quest track, I should say. And after entering the quest track, heroes may only advance one space per turn regardless of speed. You... Okay, and then the last regular action you can do is hoplite movement. You can move as many hoplites as you like, uh, sorry, as your leadership rating. So again, Heracles has leadership one, and he, so he could, at, at the start of the game, so he could move one hoplite from one region to an adjacent region, so like that. Um, you can, you cannot move a single hoplite movement uh, unit twice, uh, not using the, the standard hoplite movement. Um, you may fortify a single hoplite in each region that has a city or Sparta that you control. Um, that counts as another space in movement, so actually it would take one move to fortify here. But that's now fortified, and they get a bonus on defence there. Um, so fortified hoplites gain plus one army strength in a city or plus two in Sparta uh, during combat. Uh, moving a fortified hoplite from a city costs one as well, so like that. Um, hoplites entering a region with enemy hoplites results in battle, So, but that happens after all moves take place. Interestingly, a hero moving into an enemy, a region with enemy hoplites does not start battle, so you can actually move your hero in first if you had advantages, if they provided advantages for your hoplites, and then you could move your hoplites in to do battle. So I'm going to leave that there just now, because that might come in handy later. Equally, if, say, we're a few turns in, you moved enough hoplites into a neutral region to actually meet its region strength, you would gain control of that region. Like so. And you would place a marker there. So in this case, the Heracles and his army would control these two regions, and actually Perseus' forces still don't control anything, uh, looking at this. If you move hoplites into a region controlled by an enemy but doesn't have enemy hoplites in it, it you actually take control of the region. You don't need to meet the region strength. Um, you just take over. Um, you can do that with even one hoplite. Um, you make all your hoplite moves before battles start. And if a player has a special ability that allows hoplites to move more than one region, then they may only move through regions they control or neutral regions. Once all of the regular actions that a player can take have been completed, the player may take 
one available special action. An available special action is one that is not covered by a used action token. When you have used an act, a special action, you cover it over with one of these tokens, and until that token is removed, which happens during the end monument, uh, the build monument, when anyone builds a monument, um, that's no longer available. I'm going to whiz through many of these because they're very, very simple. Uh, some of them, and some of them are a little bit more complex, and I'll focus more time on them. March is very, very simple. Um, you can move any number of hoplites from one region to an adjacent region. So even if your leadership is only one and you've got seven hoplites in one region, you can move all seven hoplites into an adjacent region. Fortified hoplites cannot be moved this way. Hoplites that have already moved via the hoplite move or as a result of other abilities can still move in this fashion and in all other respects it's identical to a move hoplites action so battles can be initiated this way. So that's March. There's Recruit. Uh, recruit up to two hoplites in every city a player controls or four in Sparta. One recruited hoplite may start fortified. Uh, the maximum player strength, remember, however, is having 14 hoplites on the board. So if you run out of miniatures, that's it. You can't just take one back off the board from somewhere else to put it in a new location. doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. Um, so that's March, that's Recruit. Uh, I'm going to go to Hunt now. This happens when you're... You can do this only when your hero is on the same space as one of the monsters. So... If at any point, or, or, or if your hero is on the same space as a monster, you can do the hunt special action. Note, you don't have to. If you don't feel you're prepared for the hunt, you don't have to. And the monster doesn't actually attack, except uh, under certain circumstances. Um, so it, you're not necessarily in danger being in the same space as a monster. Um, however, um, canny players might actually use the fact that you're not attacking against you because there are ways to make the monster attack. But that only happens as a result of players getting involved. There is the usurp action, which happens when you have a glory token, which looks a bit like one of these. Um, you get them by completing quests or slaying monsters. Usurp means that if a hero controlling a glory token of the region of the same colour as that token, the... Sorry, I, I'm going to start that description again. When a hero is in a region that is the same colour as the glory token they hold, they may use the usurp special action to immediately take control of that region. They may recruit one hoplite in that region, which may start as fortified in a city or Sparta if they're and even if there were enemy hoplites present. So you can take control of a region with your hero if you have a glory token, even if there's an enemy army present. You can recruit a hoplite even if there's an enemy army present, uh, which you can't normally do. Um, I don't th I'm not sure I actually mentioned that earlier. Actually, it wouldn't have been relevant earlier. Um, because it's regions that you control. Um, what else can, uh, as a result of usurp? Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. Enemy hoplites must withdraw if you usurp a region using glory, and although they don't take any casualties, so they move to an adjacent neutral or controlled region. Um, and yeah, so that's what usurp is. There is the prepare special action, which has three alternatives, <clears throat> beg your pardon, and you can choose any t two of those three options. The first one is heal one injury. If you look across here, um, I've actually put um, Perseus attributes up on the assumption that we're quite far into the game and there's been a few turns of praying. So Perseus strength in speed were at three and his leadership's at four. However, he has suffered a wound uh, and when you suffer a wound, you flip the, one of your attribute tokens over and it goes to one. So for until that wound is healed, uh, Perseus has strength of one, even although he's moved the attribute up to three. And you can't actually increase it again because it would make no difference. 
So you can choose two of the following acts, choose two of the following actions, or this one of the following actions twice. You can heal an injury. Heal an injury would be to flip this back, and suddenly he's got strength three again. You can draw a combat card. So you use them when you're doing battles and when you're doing hunts. That's a combat card. You can also recruit one hoplite in a region with your hero. So you can do two of those or one of those twice. So if you, your hero is quite badly injured, you could heal two wounds. If you thought you were going to need more combat cards, you could draw two combat cards. Uh, should note that you can only hold a maximum of four combat cards, except during a hunt when there's no hand limit. Um, the penultimate um, action, special action that you can take, is the build temple action here. Um, let's actually look at a space on the board with a shrine. So for the purposes of the example, we'll say that Perseus has managed to, earlier on in the game, uh, capture Ellis. Um, so they've got a control marker and there's two hoplites there defending it. And they use their build temple action. So you would take a temple from the temple track at the bottom of the board that you saw earlier. I showed you earlier. It's got the green and the red squares with numbers and draft on it. Uh, and you <coughs> Excuse me. And then you place the next temple from that track on that space. And then that means you've got a temple there. And it's important because actually it's a temple under your control. Um, and if you'll recall, one of the victory uh, options was control five temples. Um, building a temple also allows you to recruit a priest from your supply to your priest pool. Uh, and you would use them for uh, praying uh, to monuments later. So as a result of that action, we've recruited one priest to the priest pool and it sits there waiting to pray. The final special action, and in my opinion the most interesting one, is the Build Monument special action. What, when you do the Build Monument special action, all players remove priests from all monuments. Those priests do not go back to the priest pool, they go back to the supply. So, um, you remember earlier on in the video we put a priest of Perseus uh, worshipping at the feet of Athena. He wouldn't come back here. He would go back into the supply, ready to be recruited again for te if you build a temple or something like that. Um, you then add the next level of the monument. So let's do that. Um, let's say Perseus has actually done that this turn, uh, has decided to build the next level of Athena's statue. So we've done the build monument special action. So this priest will come away, go to the supply. And you know what, it's actually just occurred to me, I've not told you how to get the god special artifacts. I told you, I think earlier, that you get the monster special artifacts by defeating the monster in a hunt. If you control the region with the monument, whatever stage that monument's at, you get the artifact. If someone else gets control of the region with the monument, you pass them the artifact. Anyway, as p the next part of this action, we would put the next level of the Athena statue on Athena. So there she goes, she's got a pair of legs now, or a pair of boots actually. And as the next part, for every temple that you control, you recruit one priest to your priest pool. So um, if we imagine that the build temple action was done by Perseus on a previous turn, we control, Perseus controls the temple, so he gets his priest back, or at least one of his priests back. Then all players remove used action tokens. So there's the priest that's just been recruited via the build monument action. Like I said, you would remove all uh, used action tokens. And if you've used any artifacts, like we did earlier on in the video, so the Horn of Plenty was sitting on the board uh, like that, or it was for the purposes of this example, you would charge it up again and it is available for use. Then, at the end of that, you trigger a monster phase and an events phase. I'll go through the monster and the events phase in a bit of detail in just a second, but it's important to note that once the monster and the events phase happen, then it's on to the next player. They start with their regular actions and then their special actions. So for the monster phase, you take the monster dice and the player who activated the monument, uh, the build monuments phase, rolls it. 
Okay, and there are a number of options on the dice. This option means nothing happens. This option means the monster moves, and the player who did the build monument phase moves the monster to an adjacent region of their choice. And I should point out, they do this for every monster on the map in whatever order they see fit. Uh, so you might actually do this because you might think there's a combination of monster movements and attacks that you might be able to do. Um, or move monsters in to um, block something off or there's a possibility of killing an enemy army, stuff like that. But you roll for every monster on the board in whatever order. Uh, so the I'll actually start again. This means no action, this means it moves, this means it does a region attack, so for instance Cerberus's region attack is kill three hoplites, which is quite nasty, so that would be quite useful if you were wanting to just, if Cerberus happened to be in the same region as a, an enemy army. Um, the best on the die is this one where you can either do a region attack or a move and it's entirely up to the person who did the build monument phase whether the monster moves or attacks once they've done, rolled the die for one monster they go on to the next until they've done all and then they proceed to the events phase in the events phase the person who did the build monument step draws the top card in this case it is a quest card. If there is a vacant spot in the quest slots at the top of the board this would actually move into that quest into that vacant slot and you would put the appropriate uh, quest token in the region so clean the Algean stables in Ellis. You would put this into the empty slot at the top of the board and you would put the quest token onto the Ellis slot. Uh, as it is um, for the purposes of this video, the no quests have been completed, this gets discarded, and that's the end of the events phase. If you had, for instance, drawn another monster, let's say for a second that it's not another Cerberus, uh, let's say that it actually said the Minotaur there, it would tell you which region you would put the Minotaur in. Um, and so you put the Minotaur on the board, you put their uh, tray out beside the board and hunt for their relic. So that um, when it's time to, if they get slain, then the player who slays the Minotaur can get the Minotaur relic. As it is, this is actually the Cerberus monster, but Cerberus is already on the board. That doesn't mean you throw it away, it means instead of bringing out a new monster, uh, and this was a mistake I made earlier, you evolve the monster. So basically, you would put this underneath the monster tray and the evolve action means it's got another hit point um, and I'll explain about them when we get to the hunts phase. If you had drawn a monster that had already been slain then I believe you draw another card and resolve that. Yes, if you draw a monster card that has already been slain you discard that card and draw again. Um, you don't draw again if it's a monster that's already in the board because you can obviously do the evolve effect. The next major thing to talk about is the monster hunt. I mean, what would uh, a game about the Greek gods and monsters be without mo heroes and monsters to be slain by them? So, uh, for the purpose of this example, let's say Perseus has actually uh, caught up with Cerberus a few turns into the game, has powered up a little bit, and is going to actually have a crack at killing him. So... Um, on his hero move, on his regular action, he ends his turn on the same space as Cerberus, and when it comes round to his special action, he selects Hunt. It should be noted that a hero can occupy the same region as multiple monsters, and they only hunt one of them, they only have to fight one of them, which is um, perhaps a little bit uh, reassuring there. So to begin the hunt, you be, go to the same region as them, and you do the hunt action. The hero then draws combat cards equal to their strength. Now, imagine they've still got the uh, they've got a combat card from earlier. So you 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 draw one before the game starts, and there are other ways to get combat cards. But let's say, well, the board set up that strength is actually four, so that means they can draw four combat cards. Also, remember, under normal circumstances, the maximum hand size you can have is four, except when you are hunting. 
and these have not been shuffled so because those are all bows they're all they're all actually no they're not all identical um, okay they aren't actually all identical so it's fine uh, they, they all look identical but they're not um, so you've got um, combat cards here and actually let's have a look at the anatomy of the card you've got the symbol the symbol is actually what you need uh, to correspond with the wound symbols on the monster. When the monster does an attack, this is the value of the defense. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it <laughs> for the combat cards. So the hero must wound the monster or the hunt ends. So let's have a look at Cerberus. Cerberus does indeed have one wound which can be done by a bow type card so let's say we're going to use this card here it's got a bow in the corner it's got the bow there so it would do one damage to Cerberus and so the hunt can continue if Perseus had been unable to wound Cerberus the hunt immediately ends unsuccessfully However, there is actually an advantage. There is actually something cool here because this is one of the special wounds on Cerberus. It's got the priest icon in it. But either, I'll come to that just shortly, and sorry for shaking the camera there. You put a damage cube to represent that that wound's been taken. And that's the hero's turn. Then the monster attacks. The player to the left of the hunter draws two monster attack cards and chooses one of them, and discards the other. Okay, so, so their surprise attack, which has a strength, I think, of one plus number of combat cards held by the hunting player. Uh, so that would be five. And then there's charge. One plus one for each uncovered wound symbol. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so actually the player would probably choose charge so we discard surprise attack because that would be combat strength of six and it deals two injuries if it's successful so the player has two choices they can defend um, or they cannot defend you play any if you're defending you play any number of combat cards with a value equal to or higher than the monster attack to prevent damage so let's see two there's a two here there's a two here as well and there are two cards with one on them that would be enough to actually block it um, if you defend at the end of the round you draw two combat cards you can also choose to take the damage which would basically mean you flip two of your attributes so probably leadership and speed at this rate um, I'm not sure I'm ready to, uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to actually expend all of these cards just blocking one attack so we're going to say actually strength factors in at the start of the round so we're going to go with we're going to keep leadership at 4 but we're going to put speed and strength they're going to be wounded they're going to be the wounds uh, but as a result of that we're going to actually draw a combat card um because, and I am going to shuffle these because they were all bows and they shouldn't all have been bows. Right, so he's taken two damage, which is bad. Um, but however, uh, Perseus has survived. Now, we need to do another, we need to do damage now. So, uh, we need to, to stay in the game. So Perseus is going to use... Um, you can use three combat cards with a bow symbol to deal damage of any type. And I've got three combat cards with a bow symbol. So, it's going to do damage to... Let's go with this one here. Uh, which is also a special one. It's got the relic symbol on it. Um, that leaves Perseus with um, two cards there. It's in the monster's turn to attack. So the player takes two monster attack cards. Um, so 
So here's two options. You can do a wild attack, which is a strength four, and it deals one injury and discards one combat card at random. Or, now this is a really mean-spirited one, especially if you're a couple of rounds in and the beast is getting quite hammered um, and um, the hero's injured, and that's recall. It's strength four, and if it succeeds, the hunt immediately ends. So I think the player who's controlling the monster is going to be a bit of an a bit horrible and say, actually, I'm either going to end the hunt or you're going to have to waste cards. So they play that at strength four. Um, this character decides to defend because they don't want the hunt to end. So uh, they would play this to block it. Um, the recall doesn't happen. No damage is taken. And because they've defended, they can draw two cards, which is cool. And then this goes on until the hunt ends. Um, if the hunt ends successfully when the last wound is applied to a monster, so in the case of Cerberus, there are seven wounds in total. It ends unsuccessfully when a, the hunting player cannot inflict wounds, or a card is played that would end the hunt, like Recall, or the hero receives a fourth injury. So Perseus is actually quite perilous here, because he's already on two after turn one. If at the end of the hunt, the player holds more than four combat cards, they must discard down to four, uh, because the hand limit is four. At the end of the hunt, you then deal with injuries. If the monster is undefeated, all injuries on it remain, making future hunts for anyone else easier. Uh, when a hero is injured, you flip the attribute token, and it is counted as one until it's healed. Then you go on to the reward situation, and here's the interesting thing. There are rewards, even if you're unsuccessful. So let's actually zoom in on the wounds that Perseus actually managed to do in the example. Now, let's say the hunt was unsuccessful. Perseus managed to inflict these two wounds. He actually managed to hit two special wounds, and that means he can still actually claim a reward. Uh, because he actually inflicted this wound here, which has the priest symbol on it, he could choose to recruit a priest. Or, because he inflicted this wound on it, which has the relic symbol on it, he could choose to take a neutral relic. Um, so actually, engaging in a hunt can be quite rewarding, even if you aren't able to beat the creature. <coughs> Excuse me. In the event of a successful hunt, the hero chooses either the monster artifact, a neutral artifact if they've inflict if they were the hero that inflicted this wound, or a priest if they were the hero that inflicted this wound. They can basically, if these wounds were inflicted by a previous hero on a different hunt, or actually even themselves on a previous hunt, they're not eligible for it. They have to take the 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 monster reward, which is the adamant tethers in the case of Cerberus. If a player deals damage to a monster outside of a hunt, for with, for instance with an artifact, they don't gain any rewards. Uh, so for instance, if uh, you were using an artifact and you inflicted damage on this, you wouldn't get a priest for it. Not, and not even if you then went and hunted it. Um, however, if you do kill the creature this way, you get to keep the monster miniature and gain the corresponding glory token. If you succeed in killing a monster, whether in or out of a hunt, you get the monster miniature as a trophy, and you get the glory token for the region. If someone else currently has the glory token for the region, you take it from them. Uh, only one person can have glory... Sorry, land. A glory token for the land. Only one person can have glory for a specific land. And remember, when you have three monster trophies, you win the game as the monster hunter. Okay. So, the next thing to look at is how battles progress when hoplites of one faction encounter hoplites of another faction. So, hoplites of two factions are in the same region. So, what happens, we're, in this scenario, we're going to, in this battle, four uh, of Perseus hoplites have entered Argolis, and two of Heracles hoplites are in that region. And one of, it's a region, actually, that is under the control of Heracles, although I didn't put a marker down. Um, I, I just set it up prior to recording, and one of the hoplites defending is actually fortified in the city. Um, so a battle is about to take place. All the movements have happened. Um, 
the defending character gets to play a card. For the purposes of the um, demonstrations, I gave each side three cards. Um, and what you're looking at are that number that gets added to your combat strength, I believe. Yes. When you, the, the defender plays a card and you would add co the number to the combat strength, resolve the special ability and take note of how many skull and crossbones. So flank attack is strength 2, which is quite good. Uh, but if you have more hoplites than your opponent in this battle, add 2 to your army strength. Well, they're outnumbered. So let's look what else we've got. Tactical maneuver, also strength 2, and there are no skulls there. Skulls are casualties that your own force will take at the end of it because of the aggressiveness of your stance. If your hero's leadership is greater than the enemy's hero's leadership, add 2 to your army strength. Now, I set up the army boards just for the sake of this earlier, and actually Heracles has slightly lower leadership than Perseus. Um, ooh, that's not good. Um, zero, reinforcements. Move any number of your hoplites to a region where a battle is taking place from a neighbouring region. So they can play one of these, or they can choose to pass. Um, let's see, well, their strength four... Um, we've got strength three already, so I think we'd probably go with tactical maneuver. If we were going to play anything, it would be tactical maneuver, which adds strength two to the attack. If they'd passed, that's absolutely fine, but they can't play any more cards um, in this battle. Then we go to the per uh, Perseus player, and he also has three cards. We've got Trap, which is strength one card, and it inflict it will inflict one casualty on uh, your own force, um, but you add your hero's leadership value to your army strength, and Perseus has quite high leadership in this uh, scenario. Encirclement, it's strength two, causes a casualty, and if you win this battle, kill three of your enemy's hoplites instead of one. That's brutal. And glory. If you have the glory token for the land in which this battle is being fought, add three to your army strength. I think what the Perseus would probably do, given that he is of the higher leadership, he'd play trap and add his leadership, which, looking at his board, is four compared to Heracles 2. Um, I set them up specifically so that Perseus would have a higher leadership for this purpose. But um, obviously that would might not have worked if Perseus didn't have high leadership. So the, the defending player gets to play another card if they want. Um, they're going to go with um, no, because at this point um, they're looking at an attacking force that's got four invading hoplites that has plus strength one to it and they've got the leader's strength added to it which is another four so they're currently on strength nine uh, the attackers are on strength nine you've got, they have defending strength two plus one for being fortified so that's three and five so they're going to lose um, even playing a card won't bring them up to the the same level so they're going to pass um, and that means they can no longer play any cards. Um, the, per the Perseus player is could still actually play another card if they want. Um, and if the Perseus player was being really mean, what they might do is they might do encirclement um, and add two to their strength. I mean, it increases their casualties, uh, but... Um, it also inflicts more damage on the enemy forces. So we're comparing army strength. Heracles' army has 5 and the Perseus' army has 11 at this point. So the uh, Perseus wins. Um, let's see, is there anything I've forgotten? Artifacts might feature into this. I'm not using them in this example, but some t if an artifact is in play and has been activated, it might feature into it. Both sides will start will remove casualties according to the attack cards they have played. Basically, an aggressive stance means that you're likely to take casualties on your own side, but it, an aggressive stance does is more likely to win. Perseus had very two very aggressive cards and takes two casualties from his attackers, uh, from his own force. Um, 
Heracles didn't take any casualties as a result of her cards played because there are no skulls on the bottom of the card. However, we then remove a casualty because per Heracles lost, but because of encirclement, Heracles loses two, three in that region. There's only two, so both of those are killed. And because there are now no enemy hoplites in an enemy region, and there are, or, or because there are two Perseus hoplites in a Heracles controlled region with no Heracles hoplites, Heracles loses control and it becomes a Perseus controlled region. So that token goes down there. Um, if an attacker loses, it does actually, if an attacker destroys all the defenders, but also loses all of their attackers in the process because of cards they've played and cards the defenders played, uh, so for instance like that, they do not gain control of the region. It would actually remain, is my interpretation. Um, they don't gain control of it because they have no hoplites left. And that's battles. They're fairly straightforward, and I imagine relatively quick playing, even when there's a lot of people around the table. If you've stuck with me this far, congratulations. We're getting very close to the end of this video. Um, just a couple more things to go through, and one of them's pr a pretty major deal in the game, and that's the quests. Uh, remember I said earlier that you put out the quest tokens and if a hero uh, ends the last uh, ends their turn on a space that has a quest token on it and they meet the requirements for the quest they can go to the uh, appropriate point on the quest track. I'm now going to talk about that. Okay, so first of all, they start their they can start a quest by finishing hero movement in a region with a quest token there. So let's look at the capture the Cretan bull one as an example. I'm going to bring it closer to the camera in the first instance. Okay, there are three levels to the quest that you can actually enter. You can either start it on the first if you have three speed or three strength. You can start on the second by having three speed or three strength and discarding two combat cards. Or you can start on the third level of the quest uh, if you have four speed, four strength and you discard two combat cards. And that, if you actually do that, you complete the quest. Um, and you get a reward once you complete the quest. Take an you get the glory token for the land that you're in and you take an additional glory token that is not in the possession of another player. So, let's see. Perseus has no combat cards to get rid of, but he has three speed, and he's gone to Crete, so that means he starts on, he basically will go to the first rank on the quest spot. On his next turn, when he gets his hero movement, he is able to move one space along, and on the turn after that, he can move one space along. It doesn't matter how fast he is on the board, you can only ever move one space along the quest trail um, in any given turn. However, imagine he's got three speed and he gets there and he's happy and he's thought, right, okay, I've got to create, I'm gonna do this create and bull. But then Heracles says, well, actually, I'm going to create as well. And you know what? I've got four strength and two combat cards. So he goes to Heracles goes to Crete. He has four strength and he discards two combat cards and he actually just jumps into the end of the quest and he beats Perseus to completing the quest. Even though Perseus got there first, Heracles was better equipped to do the quest and he was able to do it in one turn whereas Perseus could only start at the beginning of the quest and work his way through it over three turns. <coughs> I beg your pardon. So there is advantage in waiting until you're ready to start further along the quest track, but then maybe you take a gamble, you run to the quest, you get in on ground level, and you just hope no one else gets there. Um, once a hero completes a quest, they return to the region they started in, remove the quest token from the map, the player receives the war reward for the quest completion and the glory token. So in the case of the Cretan Bull, they'd get the, the brown glory token and an additional glory token. Um, discard the quest card and that would then leave a gap there for to put in another quest if during a build monuments phase you actually put out, uh, you, you drew another quest card. So I'm, I'm just going to re-emphasize, it's possible to start a quest before other players and have them beat you to it, which sucks. Um, the last thing that I need to talk about is blessing drafts. 
So let's actually have a look at the temple card. So someone has actually decided they're going to use the build temple action. I think that's a special action. There's already one temple out. They're going to build another one. We'll put this over here in Corinthia. And oh look, it says draft. That means a blessings draft happens. So when a blessings draft happens, you take the blessings deck and then draw the person who triggered the draft draws as many blessings as there are players plus one. So for the purposes of this uh, sort of like walkthrough of the rules, that would be two players plus one is three. And so you draw the top three blessings cards. So in this case, we're getting uh, one of Athena's blessings, which has the leadership. We're getting one of Zeus' blessings, which has strength, and Hermes, which has speed. And the person who triggered the draft then looks at them and picks one. Uh, and then passes the cards to the right, and the next player picks one that they like. And then it goes round the table until everyone has picked the one that's left over is discarded. So for instance, Hero's Wrath is the Zeus Blessing. After your hero movement action, discard one combat card to kill two hoplites in the same region as your hero. <coughs> Excuse me, getting a tickly throat from all this talking. So that's really useful if you um, are wanting to sort of like swoop ahead of your army and soften things up. Athena's Gift. After you win a battle, add one priest to your priest pool. Nice. And Exile. Hermes. Blessing. Deal one injury to your hero to move a monster from the region your hero is in to any region on the map. That could be quite nasty. Um, basically, you exile the monster someone else, and then you maybe do a build monument phase and hope that that monster starts attacking or something like that. And that is all of Lords of Hellas. Um, this is a really intricate game. Hang on, I think I'm going to zoom out and get another shot of the board for you in its glory. And there it is. I built up the monuments for you as well because, um, yeah, they're awesome. Uh, it's quite hard to get the entire board in, but I've done what I can there. That is Lords of Hellas How to Play. I hope you found that helpful. Uh, don't forget I said at the beginning of the video that there will be a link to the web, my website where I've got an article with photographs of the various miniatures and monsters and their cards. So you'll get a little bit more information about the game there, so check it out. If you have enjoyed this video or found it helpful, don't forget to hit like and subscribe and check back in the future when I'll have other how to play videos among other things. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you again. Bye for now.